Hello, I'm Bernadine Lennon. I'm on the board of directors of the Green Drawer Historical Society. We're located in southern Wayne County, Pennsylvania, right in the heart of the Pocono Mountains. In this presentation, I'll give an overview of events leading up to World War I and focusing on the hundreds of thousands of civilians who supported the United States during the war. Without them, I think the United States and its allies would have been hard-pressed to win the war. Some of these civilians served at home, while others were on the front lines, paying the ultimate sacrifice with their lives. I call these civilians the Army within the Army. You may have noticed for the past few years there have been articles, documentaries, commemorations for the anniversary of World War I. Why all this attention to World War I? Certainly it was not the first or the last war America would fight in. Although the war lasted four long, bloody years, and with much of that period of time as a stalemate, with neither side making progress, the United States did not join its allies fighting Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire until nearly three years into the war on April 6, 1917. In 1917, the United States had a standing army of about 200,000 men, while European countries' armies ranged between 1 and 5 million. Additionally, for many years, they had compulsory military service in Europe, which lasted for two years, so they could augment their regular armies very quickly with reserves. It's estimated that the various European nations that were at war had between 1 and 5 million men in their militaries at the beginning of 1914. During the 18 months that America fought in the war, over 4.7 million American men and women were recruited and trained to serve in the military. That in itself is an incredible accomplishment. Their sacrifice in the war was great, as you'll see in the next few slides. Over 2 million men deployed to Europe. 204,000 Americans returned home wounded. Of the 116,516 American troops who died during World War I, 53,000 died in battle or from battle wounds, and over 63,000 from disease. 75,000 Americans who died in World War I are interred in American cemeteries in Europe. To recognize the sacrifice of these service members and their families, the World War I Centennial Commission was established by an act of Congress in 2013. Members of the 12th member commission were appointed by the President and the leaders of the Senate and House of Representatives, as well as the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and the National World War I Museum. All living former presidents served on the commission as honorary chairman. The commission's mission was to plan, develop, and execute programs, projects, and activities to commemorate the centennial of World War I through 2018, and to raise awareness of and give meaning to the events of 100 years ago for all age groups. Some say World War I remains America's forgotten war, even though more Americans gave their lives during that war than during Korea and Vietnam combined. The Commission used the centennial as an opportunity to educate the country's citizens about the history of the war, to honor the heroism and sacrifice of those Americans who served, and to commemorate through public programs and initiatives the centennial of this global event. Most states created their own World War I Centennial Commission, including Pennsylvania. 
This is the email addresses to Pennsylvania's World War I Centennial Commemoration and a link to more information concerning the state's activities. Built by the World War I Centennial Commission, the National World War I Memorial, located in Pershing Park in Washington, D.C., was dedicated on April 17, 2021. Including, included in the memorial is A Soldier's Journey, a tableau composed of 38 separate figures, spread over approximately 58 feet of wall, portraying the experience of one American soldier. Starting from the left, the soldier leaves his wife and daughter, charges into combat, sees men around him killed, wounded, and gassed, and recovers from the shock to come home to his family. World War I was a pivotal clash that forever changed the world. Empires collapsed. No longer was they, there a Russian Empire, Ottoman Empire, or Austro-Hungarian Empire. Maps of the Middle East and Africa were re redrawn and new nations were born, such as Poland, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Ukraine, and others. Conflicts after World War I, such as World War II and the Cold War, were directly rooted in World War I. And today's conflicts and wars in the Middle East, Eastern and Central Europe, can be traced to the Great War. There had not been a war like this, and for many years it was referred to as the Great War. More men fought in it, and more countries from all over the globe were engaged in it than any other war. There were more military and civilian deaths than in prior wars. Women in Pennsylvania worked on farms and in factories to replace men called to military service. They formed the backbone of the Red Cross, which was small and loosely organized before the war, but it grew to include hundreds of thousands in Pennsylvania. The Red Cross helped not only soldiers, but also their families at home, and women were its strength. American Red Cross and military nurses went to France and were among those who were wounded in action and decorated for heroism. More than 200 died in service to their country during the war. The majority of, Pennsylvania's, of Pennsylvanians who served in the Army during the First World War were assigned to the 28th, 79th, and 80th Divisions. African Americans from Pennsylvania served in the 92nd and 93rd Divisions as the armed services were racially segregated, as was most of American society. Formed initially from Pennsylvania National Guard units, the 28th Division was engaged with the enemy beginning in late June 1917, just two months after the United States entered the war, and continued engagements through November 11, 1918. The 79th Division was one of 16 National Army Divisions of draftees authorized under the National Defense Act of May 18, 1917. It retained a substantial number of men from Philadelphia and eastern Pennsylvania. The 79th Division was engaged with the enemy from September 1918 to the Armistice of, 9, of November 11th. The 80th Division originally consisted of men mostly drafted from western Pennsylvania Appalachian, Virginia, and West Virginia. The 80th Division was engaged with the enemy beginning late August 1918 and continued through to the armistice. All three of these divisions fought in the largest and costliest battle ever fought by the armed forces of the United States, the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, which spanned 49 days and eventually drew in 1.2 million American troops alone, in addition to the millions of troops from France, Great Britain, the German Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It took the lives of over 26,000 Americans and wounded another 96,000. 
most of them within a period of about three weeks of heavy fighting. On March 19, 1917, the United States Navy became the first branch of the U.S. Armed Forces to allow women to enlist in a non-nursing capacity. Two days later, Miss Loretta Walsh of Philadelphia, who was 21 years of age, was the first woman to enlist in the United States under this new rule. Until the war, the United States was completely dependent on European sources, particularly Germany, for chemical dyes and optical glass. The European sources for these critical materials had dried up since the beginning of the war in 1914. Under wartime conditions, American science and industry attacked and solved a highly technical problem that was critical to America's war effort. After the war, Pennsylvania erected the Pennsylvania State Memorial in Varennes, France, in honor, to, in honor of those who served in the Great War. Pennsylvania also erected a memorial to the 80th Division in Nantillois, France. When at full strength, the 80th Division consisted of 23 men, mostly from Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia, and was nicknamed the Blue Ridge Division. It was known to never have failed to gain its objective and was the only American Expeditionary Force Division called upon three times in the Great Use Argonne Offensive. It captured two German soldiers for every one of its men who was wounded. The division suffered 17,000 casualties out of its average strength of 23,000 men. Now I'd like to go into a bit of history of the German Empire and the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire, which were two of the major plower, uh, powers in World War I, and this will help set the stage for the war. Following the defeat of France by Prussia in the Franco-Prussian War of 1871, the German Empire was created, joining many German-speaking independent states in Central Europe. The Austro-Hungarian Empire had been created four years earlier, in 1867, and was also composed of different states. While the German Empire was joined by a common language, governing the Austro-Hungarian Empire was difficult, given the different ethnicities, cultures, and languages within the empire. In fact, because of its multinational nature, Austro-Hungarian military recruited from all parts of the empire. German was designated the official language in its military. Each soldier had to learn 80 German words so that he could understand basic commands, such as attention, halt, and fire. Soldiers also had to memorize about a thousand technical terms regarding weaponry to facilitate everyday communication any, any language spoken by at least 20% of the soldiers in a regiment was designated the regimental language. Because so few regiments were composed of a single ethnicity, some regiments had two languages and a few had four recognized languages that were spoken. There was a rising sense of nationalism within the different states in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Smaller states in the empire wanted their independence while larger states tried to prove their dominance and power. By the end of the first day, decade of the 20th century, the ma major European powers were divided into two major alliances. When war broke out in 1914, the countries throughout the world began to support the major powers. The Entente and Central Powers expanded to 10 warring nations. By 1917, 22 nations were at war. Some reports have 30 nations involved in the war, the difference being that some nations provided manpower and resources to one side or the other without declaring war. The European powers competed for colonies with whom they traded for valuable raw materials such as coal, oil, wood, iron ore, cotton, wool, leather, etc., in Africa, the South Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and Southeast Asia. This map shows the Entente powers and their colonies in gray, 
and the Central Powers in their colonies in black. Imperial rivalry and competition among the major European powers for new territories and possessions fueled tension between major European nations and became a factor in the outbreak of the war. Militarism was one of the main causes of the First World War. Great Britain was a power at the turn of the 20th century. Germany wanted to be um, an empire in itself and to rival that of Britain. This led to a naval arms race between the two countries. There was an increase in military influence on government policy and military control of civilian government in Europe. This could be reflected particularly in Germany and Russia. The war atmosphere caused by the alliances also led to an armaments race among the powers. There was a significant rise in both army and naval forces of the European powers in the early 1900s. Nationalism, alliances, imperialism, and militarism were all festering in 1914 when Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir apparent to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and his wife were assassinated by a Serbian nationalist in June of that year. This was the spark that started the war. And it led to Austro-Hungarian Empire to declare war on Serbia. Russia was an ally of Serbia and declared war on the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The empire's ally, Germany, declared war on Russia. Russia's ally, France, declared war on both Germany and Austro-Hungary. And so the dominoes fell. As the war progressed, each coalition added new alliances. The U.S. had a policy of neutrality when the European powers went to war. However, the policy of neutrality was not reciprocated by the Central Powers. While our president was having diplomatic meetings, German U-boats were attacking Allied shipping. Over 7,500 Allied military, commercial, and passenger ships were attacked by U-boats during World War I. On January 31, 1917, Germany declared unrestricted warfare on all shipping, including passenger ships. That same month, a telegram sent from Germany to its ambassador in Mexico proposed an alliance between Germany and Mexico should the United States appear to be entering the war. The proposal was that if Mexico joined the German Empire against the United States, and if the empire was victorious, Mexico would recover Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. The telegram was intercepted by the British and passed on to President Wilson, and this helped generate support for the United States to enter World War I. President Wilson asked Congress on April 2, 1917, to declare war on Germany. Congress voted in favor of the war, and President Wilson signed the formal declaration of war on April 6, 1917. The next, on December 7, 1917, the U.S. declared war on Germany's ally, Austria-Hungary. Now, on behalf of the Green Dreher Historical Society, I researched 142 men and women who served during the war and who had ties to the Green Dreher community the culmination of which was the recently published book, Green Dreher in the Great War. Research involves a lot of grunt work, and because there was no central location to identify World War I veterans in my community, I started by walking local cemeteries, locating American flags placed by the local American Legion, and which indicated a possible veteran burial. And these were the sources that I eventually identified and which helped me um, in writing the book. Even before the United States entered World War I, Americans were helping our allies. 
The Americans formed the Committee for the Relief of Belgium, which fed 9 million people daily in German-controlled regions of Belgium and France. The American Red Cross provided aid in European cities, remote villages, and the front lines before we declared war in April of 1917. On the home front, the United States government lacked the capacity to provide social services for recruits and soldiers. Today, the armed forces have morale, welfare, and recreation departments, libraries, gymnasiums, and other services at each installation to serve the soldier, sailor, airman, and marine, and their families. These are important factors contributing to how a service member performs and how their families support them. As I mentioned earlier, the United States Armed Forces grew from 200,000 men to 4 million men and women in just 18 months. It took all the government's resources to build and expand its 32 training camps to accommodate an average of 30,000 men at each one. Many of these training camps were built within 90 days, so you can imagine the amount of men and material dedicated to this unprecedented building and training program. There were no government resources available for anything else. However, General Pershing, the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, realized social services were lacking and petitioned the War Department to arrange for these services in training camps, on ships deploying troops to France and in Europe, up to and including the front lines. The American Red Cross recruited more than 22,000 professionally trained nurses to serve in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps, and over 10,000 of these served near the Western Front. Another 1,500 nurses served in the U.S. Navy. American Red Cross nurses also worked in American units attached to the British and French armies long before the United States entered the war. The first Army nurses sailed for Europe in April 1917, preceding the American troops. They established six base hospitals with the British Expeditionary Forces, and then in October they began serving with the Ex American Expeditionary Forces in France, Belgium, Siberia, Italy, Serbia, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. A campaign to recruit nurses began in early December 1917. Recruiting posters were designed stating that 20,000 20, nurses were needed by the Army. Articles appeared in newspapers setting forth the urgent need for nurses in the Army hospitals, and letters were mailed to all schools of nursing, as well as to nursing associations and other central directories. In less than one month, over 2,000 replies had been received by the Surgeon General's office. It's estimated that one-third of all American nurses served in the military during World War I. Although allied, Amer although allied military leaders wanted to keep the nurses far from danger, they realized that many more combatant lives could be saved if wounds were first treated near the front. Nurses served with forward units, at casualty clearing stations, working long hours under poor conditions. From April 6, 1917 to November 11, 1918, there were 134 deaths among members of the Army Nurse Corps, primarily from tuberculosis, influenza, and pneumonia. Four women from the Green Drear community served as nurses in the war and are highlighted in the in the book. May Carter was born in Monroe County and attended nursing school at Chester County Hospital outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This photo is of her on her graduation from nursing school in 1916. She worked at hospitals in Chester County and Philadelphia and was the exact type of nurse the Red Cross wanted to recruit, a trained nurse with experience. In the fall of 1918, she volunteered to serve overseas with the American Red Cross. 
Prior to her leaving, May returned to her family, who was now living in Scranton. While there, she contracted the Spanish influenza and died from pneumonia on October 5th. She is interred in South Sterling's Pine Grove Cemetery. Relief and welfare organizations provided social, recreation, education, and religious activities lacking in American camps of the time period. The YMCA coordinated the work of six other welfare organizations. The Young Women's Christian Association built hostess houses staffed by 1,000 YWCA workers at 32 military camps, which provided a place for servicemen to meet with friends and visit with family members. The YWCA supported women in the armed forces also, at home and overseas, and women who worked in war manufacturing factories and nurses by providing housing, training, education, and moral guidance. The Knights of Columbus built and staffed 493 recreation and entertainment centers for soldiers of all faiths and provided Catholic services in training camps. They maintained over 135 centers throughout the western and eastern war zones, provided 1,800 tons of stationery for troops to write letters home. Nearly 3,000 members of the Knights of Columbus staffed these centers. Formed three days after the United States entered World War I, the Jewish Welfare Board's mission was to support Jewish soldiers in the U.S. military during the war. It also recruited and trained rabbis for the military service, provided support materials to these newly commissioned chaplains, maintained oversight of Jewish chapel facilities at military installations, it ensured kosher foods were available at the training camps, as well as the larger effort to help the American military forces in general. The War Camp Community Service Organization was one of two non-sectarian organizations providing social and recreation opportunities for military service members. It first established booths near camps where soldiers could find directions to libraries, gymnasiums, and other sources of entertainment in the local community which surrounded the military camps. The service also held community dances and dinners for citizens and soldiers to promote unity and camaraderie between the two. Other activities included founding citizen and soldiers sports leagues, opening swimming pools, and organizing patriotic song rallies. It held activities promoting wholesome interaction between service members and the local community. The American Library Association was the second non-sectarian organization created to support the troops. It provided library services to the U.S. soldiers and sailors in America, France, and other locations. It raised $5 million from public donations and erected 32 libraries at the military camps. It distributed approximately 7 to 10 million books and magazines and provided library collections to over 500 locations, including military hospitals. Nearly 1,200 library workers served in libraries sponsored by the association. The first group of Salvation Army officers to join the American troops left New York on August 12, 1917 just two months after the first American troops set foot on French soil. They set up small huts located near the front lines where they could give soldiers clothes, supplies, and baked goods. After discovering that serving baked goods would be difficult considering the conditions of the huts and the limited rations, they began frying donuts in soldiers' helmets. These tasty treats boosted morale and won the hearts of many soldiers. Nicknamed Donut Lassies, the women of the Salvation Army 
served coffee and donuts to soldiers in the trenches. They gave spiritual aid and comfort to the American soldier and were there to be a link with home and family. Over 400 Salvation Canteens were built in France in the next 15 months, some right at the front. By far, the largest civilian organization to support the armed forces was the Young Men's Christian Association. The YMCA had decades of experience supporting the military, morale, and well-being, as well as their families going back to the Civil War. General Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, said, I have had the opportunity to observe the YMCA operations, measure the quality of its personnel, and mark its beneficial influences on our troops, and I wish unreservedly to commend its work for the Army. During World War I, the YMCA built 4,000 huts for religious and education services at training camps and overseas and operated 1,500 canteens. It operated 44 factories in Europe, which produced cookies and candies for the troops. The American YMCA expanded work to provide welfare to soldiers held in POW camps, regardless of whether they were in camps for Allied or Central Powers. YMCA workers went to the front lines and suffered the same poor food, lice, and fear as the soldiers they were there to support. YMCA huts were gathering places for soldiers and took the place of home, school, social club, church. In cities, the hut could be a large private dwelling or French chateau, converted for use as a hut. YMCA post exchanges sold candy, tobacco, cigarettes, chewing gum, canned food, preserves, and toiletries. They met the new listee at home, accompanied him on troop trains, provided recreational services at training camps, accompanied the service member on troop transports, and served with him near the front lines. On the front lines, the hut was nothing more than a half-demolished building, barn, cellar, or dugout, in which the YMCA provided coffee, tea, donuts, and cigarettes. The top photo shows some of the services the YMCA provided in the war zone, the soldier sitting on the floor is reading a magazine. To the right of center, in the rear, you can see a small library of books and coffee and other refreshments. The cellar was a respite for the soldiers. The bottom left image shows the iconic red triangle of the YMCA. Above the entrance to a dugout, with soldiers resting, holding cups of coffee below the field of battle. Like the Salvation Army, the YMCA also had mobile canteens offering food and hot coffee to troops, particularly when they were marching. Now I'd like to focus on one member of the YMCA and who was from the Green Dreher community. Charles was born in La Anna, Pike County, Pennsylvania, and served as a YMCA secretary prior to, during, and after World War I. As a YMCA secretary, he organized activities for soldiers. YMCA representatives were aboard board troop trains, taking the young recruits to basic training, answering their questions, ensuring food for them at stops along the way. Upon arrival at the military camp, the YMCA secretary would assist the new soldier in sending civilian clothes home providing stationery to write home. The YMCA secretary managed entertainment, social and sporting events, established a camp library, organized reading and writing classes for illiterate soldiers. They organized religious services, managed the exchange which offered toiletries, a barber shop, and snacks. The secretary accompanied the soldiers aboard troop ships, providing reading materials, and organizing sporting events. Overseas, the YMCA secretary 
established or managed a YMCA hut, which could be located anywhere from behind the front lines up to the fighting, and which normally contained um, and provided beverages, food, toiletries, and newspapers. Charles served with the French army for several months and with the Italian army participating in the final battle between the Italian and Austro-Hungarian forces, which resulted in the defeat of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. For his service, he received the Italian War Cross, which was awarded to military personnel and civilians for exceptional valor in the face of the enemy, and the Bronze Medal of the City of Rome for his work with the YMCA following the war in reconstruction of that city. These organizations and their tens of thousands of volunteers provided relief and comfort to the soldier, sailor, marine, and airman on the front lines and to their families at home. Their massive programs of relief, morale, and welfare services for the military had never been seen before in history. They served alongside the doughboys in the trenches of France and sailed with the soldiers and sailors aboard troop ships. They aided millions of troops and civilians under adverse conditions, putting their own lives in harm's way. For many of these civilian organizations, their work did not stop when the war ended. Post-war programs included reconstruction of cities and villages destroyed by the war. Their work included educational services financed by war work funds, which enabled ex-servicemen to complete studies interrupted by the war or to secure further preparation for re-entry into civilian life. Let no one say again that World War I was the forgotten war. While we commemorate the sacrifices of our service members each November 11th, let us also remember the men and women who made up the Army within the Army of World War I. To learn more about the Green Drear Historical Society and how to purchase Green Drear in the Great War, please visit our website. The website also lists upcoming events all the publications we offer for sale, some of which are noted here, as well as articles about local history, and a History at Home series on the Historical Society's YouTube channel. Please contact us if you have any questions. We look forward to hearing from you. And thank you for your attention. And by the way, this creature behind me is Jakob, our family kitten. Bye-bye. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Here's